We're on an afternoon hike today and we are foraging, doing some last minute foraging before winter officially sets in. There's some snow on the ground and we've had some really cold weather, but we're still looking for some berries. So we're looking for high bush cranberries today and rose hips primarily. And I even found a few currants. Currants are a lot harder to find. They're super delicious. They taste like a pomegranate. The rose hips taste a lot like ketchup once they're processed and the high bush cranberries are really tart. They're not actually a cranberry, but I think they get their name because they're really tart like a cranberry. They're actually really delicious once they've frozen just a little bit, but we have some plans to make things with these back at the cabin. We need quite a bit more, so Eric and I are just gonna keep picking with the dogs. It's a little bit hard to navigate through this terrain because there's Devil's Club, which is really spiky, and the rose roses, the wild roses also have spikes too. Everything's pretty much lost its foliage, but these berries are really easy to identify. a pretty awesome spot we found right off the bat we've got all three of these berries here and we don't usually find the currants that often these are the rose hips and I'm just kind of selectively picking which ones I think look good I'm going for like the dark raspberry colored looking ones or if there's any maybe orange light red that's a nice color to pick too but if they're if they're too far gone I am NOT picking those ones and right behind me I also have the high bush cranberry plant. You can't really confuse these with other plants, but there is the current that looks, it looks pretty similar. And this one's right over here. And the current plants don't get as big and they are usually more translucent. So like the high bush cranberries are cloudy and these ones are more oh, like a clear looking and they definitely taste different. And I can also tell too by the, the bottom the end of it looks a little bit different than the high bush cranberry. I would actually love if we could find these ones more because they're they're really really good flavor. Oh there's a lot over here. Oh there's more currants. what is loaded. I think one of my favorite parts about picking these as we're getting closer to winter is they do get a little sweeter but there's no leaves on these plants so you just grab a handful. This is like one of the easiest berries to pick. You get so many of these things. But I think I think we got enough for the high bush cranberries. We wanted to get about two cups. We've got over that. I think we got enough for the rose hips. We're gonna scour this little last section here and then we're heading home. It's getting cold out here. Leave a couple for the birds. We made it back to the cabin and we cleaned up all of our rose hips and berries last night. We're first gonna be starting with the rose hips and I'm making ketchup. We've done it a few different times before. It turns out really nice. I don't know what it is about these guys, but they just have a strange tomato flavor. They also taste a little bit fruity too. There's lots of different things you can do with them. You can definitely eat them raw, but we're going to be processing them into ketchup today. For this recipe, I've got about six cups of these that are going into this pot. Some of them are frozen too, which is okay. And then I also have a handful of Roma tomatoes. I'm adding some this year because I want it to be a little bit thicker. It takes a while to get it, cooking it down to get it really thick like ketchup. I'm gonna add enough water to cover just the tomatoes and the rose hips, and then I'm gonna get this simmering probably on medium or high for about like 30 minutes or so. While that's going, I'm going to be pulling down some herbs that we have drying. They have been drying for a long time 
and I finally have some time to get them down and go through them. This is a little drying rack that Eric made for me about two years ago and I use it a whole bunch. And we even have little nails behind this on our wall where we store onions too. Let's get all these off. Around the Christmas lights, huh? We get a lot of questions about drying herbs and it is actually very simple to do. Um, I wait till near the end of the season, our season, and I cut the plants down, usually at the base of them, and I'll tie them up with a little bit of twine, and then I will just hang them. Um, you don't really wanna hang them in direct sun when you're drying things like this. You kinda of wanna put them in a good, in a ventilated area, preferably warmer, preferably less moisture. So our cabin is the perfect spot for it. Usually does not take even two weeks for them to be dry, and these ones have been hanging for about a month. And that's really all there is to it. It's really simple, straightforward to do. I really like fresh herbs. I'm a huge fan of herbs in general. I love all of them. And if it were my choice, I would live somewhere where I could just grow them all year round. But that's just not the case here. So we're making do with what we have and we have to dry a lot of these. Most of these will not perennialize. So we get what we get that year. And a lot of them, we do start from seed. So, you know, they don't get entirely huge. In fact, this year, a lot of our herbs stayed a lot smaller. This year we dried some thyme. I have rosemary, two different sages, and some mint. And every year it's kind of different, not just based upon what grows well in that particular year, but also what we have kind of back storage of. So some years I've been able to grow something and I have so much of it that I don't have to really store the herb the next year because I have extra. We strictly air dry and don't do any sort of dehydration because of our solar system. We have a smaller solar system and just have really minimal energy needs here. We've been able to get away with that. We like it that way. So this works for me because I don't have to really pay energy to do this. I can just hang it and let the environment take care of it for me. We had some dehydrators when we moved up here, but we sold them. We did not want to run a generator all day to dry our food in that manner. And now at this point, these are really, for the most part, pretty easy to deal with because they're really dry. So I just get like a flat table or surface and you can just crinkle them. That's how you know when they're done. So I just crinkle them like that and just the leaves come off of the plant, not the actual stems. Because these ones have dried for so long, they're really crispity. You don't have to let them go this long by any means. And I'm actually gonna be kind of careful not to get too much of the stem because the, st the stem's also very dry too. If you catch these a little bit sooner, you can actually just run your hand along the stems and get the leaves off that way. Ooh, that's very crunchy. This one's white sage. It's a little bit strong. I didn't know how to use this one as much. I think it's probably better for like a dried herb because it's, it really was strong fresh. I'm a big fan of sage, but this one was, I guess, a learning curve for me. And then from here, I just add it to a mason jar, depending upon how much I have. This one we're gonna fit into a pint. And I try not to crunch the leaves up yet because that's where a lot of the aromas and flavor is in. So I feel like if I crunch it now, I'm not gonna have as much of that released at the time of cooking. Just lightly pack it in there. And there you go. It's as simple as that. I've got some dried sage now. These are just a few of our other herbs that we have left over from previous years. Generally speaking, they last, they can last quite a while, especially if you store them in like a cooler, darker place. We do that in our conics. We store a lot of our extras out there. So they do last a long time if you have them, you know, sealed up nicely. But I want to say in general, two years to three years is probably max what I would expect something like this to last, especially if you had it like we do where it gets a little bit of, you know, sunlight and it's warmer inside of our cabin. These are some of the herbs that I like to have on hand. We have dill, coriander, one of my absolute favorites, rosemary, tarragon, sage. I have some celery leaves and some thyme. In the three years we've had a garden here, we've only had coriander seed once, and that was the first summer we were here. So that's probably something that I cannot rely on every year. So I'm very happy that I have this saved from that first year. And because it's a seed and you crack it open when you use it, it's still very fresh. It has a really nice flavor to it. You can see one like this one has been exposed to the sunlight a little bit and it's, I don't wanna say the word bleached, but it has changed its color 
but once you get into the middle, you can see it's still green inside the jar. Something I'm missing this year is oregano, which is very sad. It does, in fact, overwinter here, even though it is a zone five plant, but they didn't overwinter that well and I was not able to pull that much for them. So I have no dried oregano this year. I'm gonna to get to putting the rest of these away. A lot of them are really simple. I will say time is a little bit trickier. You have to kind of run your hand the opposite way that the plant's growing to get just the little leaves to break off. That one's quite a bit more time consuming. This is a really simple thing to try if you haven't done it. And I mean, I think it's awesome because if you're not, if you're in a zone where maybe you can't grow these plants all winter or they're more dormant and they're not putting on a lot of growth, you can still have the herbs in winter. Definitely doesn't compare to the fresh thing. It's a lot different, but I still really like it. And we'll make a lot of little blends out of these and use them all winter long. I don't know if you can tell, but I think a lot of these herbs are a lot better fresh, but the one exception to that is mint. I feel like mint is more potent dried. I don't know why, but I just personally feel that way. So it's always a favorite of mine to dry. And we usually use it for, for tea mainly. We're gonna check on our rose hips too, since we finished all of that. Okay, this stuff looks pretty good for now. We're gonna be transferring this outside to let it cool for a little. We're gonna be straining it once it's cooled down a little bit to get rid of the tomato seeds and the rose hip seeds. We wanna keep a lot of the pulp and skins for the final product. I've done this a few different times and I've done it through cheesecloth and a sieve and it doesn't work all that well. I end up losing a lot of the pulp. So I think I'm gonna try using our grinder and we're gonna see how that works. And I know that I want to process the remaining skins and pulp one more time in another batch of water. We're ready to get our mixture strained. We're gonna see how this goes. And we've got our strainer attachment on our grinder. Not bad. Not bad. This is working pretty good so far and I'm almost done. We're gonna be reprocessing the pulp like I mentioned earlier. A lot of the thick parts of the rose hip and the tomato is actually coming out into the sauce that we're gonna be making and just a few seeds are coming through. A while back we broke our strainer that was for tomato sauce so we have one in there that does let some seeds through. This is gonna go back on the stove with some water and you can see there's really not much skin left in there. A lot of it came out in our mixture. We're just gonna cover it with probably about that much water, just enough to kind of cover the rose hips again. And I'm gonna let that cook down, but probably not for as long, maybe like 15 minutes or so this time. Our second batch of the rose hip and the tomatoes has cooled. So we're gonna run it through our strainer. Okay, well that works really well, a lot better than I was expecting. We ended up with just a lot of the seeds, so really none of it's going to waste and I should just be able to feed that to the chickens. And this is all ready. We're gonna get started on our ketchup. We've got a lot of ingredients behind me going into this recipe, but first things first, I'm gonna be sauteing some garlic and some onions. I'm just gonna add a little olive oil. It's time to add our other ingredients. And this is honestly a mishmash of recipes. There's a few online that I can link for rose hip ketchup, but I did add the tomatoes this time and I'm, I'm just gonna add kind of what I want to add. So we're gonna do a little bit of vinegar, probably about half a cup or so. And then I've got some brown sugar because we wanna make sure that it's sweet. Probably about a cup of brown sugar. And just because I'm also adding some honey, ketchup is traditionally quite sweet. So ours is gonna be sweet too. You can add any of the spices that you want, but I would definitely suggest adding some dry mustard powder. I've got two 
tablespoons of yellow mustard powder that I have. And we're doing a few herbs. I'm gonna add some rosemary, celery, leaves. We're gonna do some salt and pepper, of course. We're gonna add a little cumin powder, some paprika. I've got some cayenne pepper. And then I'm gonna add just a little bit of cloves and allspice, ground cloves. Not too much of this stuff. This is honestly probably more of a fancy ketchup recipe, kind of borderline barbecue sauce, but this is how we made it last time too and it turned out really nice. I'm not quite sure how long I'm gonna let this cook. I'm going more for a consistency. And in fact, I'm gonna be immersion blending all of it, so I'm not worried about the chunks in there. I'm thinking it's probably gonna go for at least 20, maybe even 30 minutes. It has a nice consistency, but I do want it thicker for canning. While that's reducing, we're gonna start on the next recipe, which is going to be a hot pepper jelly. We have actually never made a hot pepper jelly, believe it or not. And we're not gonna be using quite traditional ingredients. We're gonna use our high bush cranberries and currants from yesterday. And we're gonna be using an assortment of hot peppers. We're kind of doing a spin-off on a cranberry jalapeno jelly recipe. So Eric actually dried these peppers for us probably about a month ago. They're hung up on some, some string and I see the the needle is still attached to it. Um, but he did a great job. He strung the needle through each of the stems and these peppers were actually all green when they started. So we have serranos, we have jalapenos and a few other even hotter peppers that I don't quite remember the name right now. And it's just so neat. They totally dried out. They're like crunchy. And we figured that they'd be perfect for this recipe. We're not gonna use all of these because we wanna enjoy our jam. So I'm just gonna be using a couple and I'm gonna get a few of these chopped up. We want this real spicy, so we're gonna do one more pepper and hope that's not a mistake. This stuff is awesome. We've never done this before and in general, the peppers do really well here. So I think this is probably something we can do in the future, but Eric had heard about doing this and tried it and I'm excited because they're just like pepper flakes. This is also a really easy recipe. I'm gonna be getting the high bush cranberries and the peppers and a few other ingredients in a pot. And we're not gonna be straining this one because we want it to be jam. I add a splash of vinegar and water to our high bush cranberry and hot pepper jelly. And we're just gonna let this cook down for a little bit to let the berries actually pop and let their liquid release. And I have to get a whole bunch of canning stuff ready. We're gonna try and synchronize these and water bath them at the same time. We transferred our jelly to the wood stove to make some room for our water bath canner. And I'm gonna immersion blend our ketchup. We've never harvested these rose hips so late in the year and they were notably sweeter once the frost had come. I mean, we've had a lot of frost, but they're, they're really tasty now. All right, that looks about good. And I'm actually going to turn on the heat and reduce it just a little bit more. It never really gets the same exact thickness as like ketchup from a bottle. I'm sure that's probably just because we're using rose hips and not what factories are using to make their ketchup. Maybe it's the fact that I have less sugar. I'm gonna do a taste test too to make sure we have enough sugar because we may be adding a little more too. I think it tastes really good. It's, I mean, it's delicious. I don't even know how to describe that. It's, it's a little more kicked up than traditional ketchup. Well, our ketchup is ready to be canned. It's nice and thick. We've got a whole bunch of jars. I'm not really sure how much it's gonna make. It's been a long time since we have bought ketchup from the store. We just don't actually consume ketchup that much as a condiment. So I'm pretty excited for this. The rose hips taste a lot like tomatoes and it just, it works perfect, I think, for this kind of stuff. Or even if you're making barbecue sauce. We like to add this to chili. You can put it as, on pizza. And another way we like to use it is on top of meatloaf. Oh no, I splashed my face. We ended up with six half pints of the ketchup and we have a bunch of extra for tomorrow's dinner. I've got to get our jelly back on here and we're gonna be adding the pectin to it. This jelly is extremely tart. I had to wait to add the sugar per the pectin's instructions. We're using Sure Gel Less Sugar, a box of that. And I have that added with about half a cup of sugar in here. 
So I'm going to add that into our mixture. And we're going to let this come to a boil. And then I'm going to add the rest of the sugar. And I'm doing three cups for this recipe. The high bush cranberries do have some natural pectin, but I'm not really sure how much they have. So I'm kind of relying on the box. Okay, in the rest of our sugar goes. This stuff is really tart, so we are adding quite a bit of sugar, not just for the pectin to work, but also to balance that tanginess of those high bush cranberries. I'm gonna get this back to a boil for exactly one minute, and then we are going to be adding it to our jars. Well, this is good news. We ended up with a lot more than I was anticipating. I'm gonna get some lids on these and then we're gonna put everything in the water bath for 15 minutes. Well, unfortunately and fortunately, it looks like it's going to be two batches. And after this, we are calling it quits for the night and we're gonna pick back up with our work tomorrow. We have some pretty cool stuff planned for today, but first thing we're doing, because it's going to take the longest, is we're going to be rendering some lard out of this huge chunk of pork fat I got here. This pork fat is partially frozen, which helps it go through the grinder. Pork fat can get really messy if it's not cold when you're grinding it. And you don't have to grind it if you're making lard. It just makes it a lot easier and we're gonna end up with more lard at the end. Okay. We're gonna be rendering our fat in this Dutch oven and I don't think it's all gonna fit in here. I'm just gonna start with a little bit and I like to do that so I get like a nice greasy layer in there first and then I'll add more fat in. And when we're first doing this, you want to keep the heat on pretty low or maybe medium, just not very high. Right, we have two pots going and they are nice and low. The reason you want to cook it so slow is because the fat, as it melts, it'll turn into liquid. And if you have the heat up a little too high, not only can it kind of like burn the end product, the lard that you're gonna get, but also it will cook some of the fat and you won't get as much liquid fat as a result, if that makes any sense. And the whole purpose of this is to cook out the impurities. So we're evaporating the water, we're cooking out any meat, we're gonna strain it and then end up with a beautiful lard, which is awesome for storing. It stores for years and it is wonderful for cooking with. We purchased this fat from a butcher a few months back. I had hoped to use it with the moose that we were going to potentially harvest during moose hunting season. But since then, Eric and I have actually decided that we don't really like to add this as much to the moose meat. So it, that's perfect because I love lard and I don't have any lard. All I have is tallow right now. It takes a little while for that fat to cook down, so we're going to work on something different. Yes, something I'm very excited for. We're going to be making blueberry wine. We've never done it before, but we did really good on blueberries, putting a lot of hard work picking blueberries, and this is six pounds of them right here. These are frozen. We're also going to be using four pounds of sugar. We've got two gallons of water, so I'm thinking we're going to get a little over two gallons of wine. Got a five gallon bucket. Had to buy a couple things to make this. We have wine yeast, pectic enzymes. Is that what it is? Pectic enzyme. Enzyme. Yeah, we've never done it before, so we don't really know what we're doing. We're just <laughs> giving it a go, and I'm very excited for it as well. It's really simple, but it takes a little while, and we're going to see how it goes, and we'll keep you informed. Yep. So we're going to dissolve this sugar into the water and let it cool a tiny bit, and then we're going to add it into our blueberries. So this was four pounds of sugar here. So we've read that using frozen blueberries is actually better. So I'm trying to squish these a little bit, release a little of the flavor. Let's add that sugar water here. I just want my pour on. 
Oh my gosh, look at that cover. Are you going to mash it all or no? Just let it be. I'll just let it be. We don't have to add the rest of the ingredients until tomorrow once the mixture has cooled a little bit. Yep, so we're just going to put a lid on this, let it sit in here in the kitchen, and then we're going to continue on with our lard. That's probably too much heat in there. No, put it down here. Well, I never thought I would say this, but we are actually frying up bits of fat in their own fat right now. We are removing some of the cracklings, which is just little bits of the fat that don't completely break down, or it's possible too, there's some of the meat that was attached to the fat, and they're called cracklings, so they look like this, and I'm just putting them in another little pan over here and frying them up, getting them extra toasty, and those are going to be for dinner tonight. This lard has been going for a few hours and we're getting really close to the end. I have to watch it now a lot closer, make sure that we don't scorch the lard. We're gonna be straining all those cracklings out and I'll know it's done when I don't see any more bubbles anymore, when I don't see any, you know, like foam or bubbles, which would indicate that there's no moisture in the lard anymore. Our lard is officially done. We strained it once and I'm about to strain it again. And I know it's done because there's no bubbles anymore, but the oil is obviously extremely hot. So I'm gonna strain it one more time. Probably would have been better to use a measuring cup, but I have one over here that's dirty and you don't wanna introduce anything back into the lard. You wanna keep everything super dry. So only use clean things. Ready to get it jarred up. Well, it's time for dinner. We're gonna do some moose meatballs and some steamed Brussels sprouts. Meatballs are super easy. We got one pound of moose meat here. We're gonna do an egg. We got some seasonings. We have some of the dried herbs that Ariel took down earlier and one of the chilies. We're gonna do garlic and onion and then a nice little topping we're gonna to do in here. This is the cracklings from the lard we just rendered. So these are gonna have a lot of flavor in them. I'm probably not gonna put all these, but I'm gonna do about half. Those cracklings. I would say go heavy on the cracklings, you know? More than that? I don't know, let me get a mixed up first. Huh. You put a chili in there? Yeah. That's good. Oh, skip my eyes. Are you ready for your toppings? Yeah, let me throw them in there. I'm just... Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to be able to lose. My eyes are on fire. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is a cute set. I'm sorry. That... Take a little off that one? Take a little off that one, yeah. That was yours. <laughs> what? I'm pretty sure that was yours. Maybe it's not. It's the cracklings. Well, this meal looks delicious. For some reason, I thought it'd be cool to eat these with toothpicks, but I don't know how that's gonna work out. We've got the cranberry and jalapeno jelly. We're gonna try it, and then we got the ketchup. And these are supposed to be miniature meatballs. I made them too big though. We should probably have tried the meatball plain Hey, those look first. good. I'm gonna try the ketchup. That's a spicy meatball. I got like the, um, the hot pepper in there. That's really good, the cracklings. Mm -hmm. The ketchup is really good. Yeah, and I don't, I, we're gonna call it ketchup. It's probably not really ketchup. It's probably oh more God. like a really festive barbecue sauce ketchup. Like a spicy ketchup. How's the jelly? Good? Honestly, I don't know which one I like better. Those both are amazing on meatballs. I already had a feeling it's better, but like cranberry sauce, like Thanksgiving, especially with the Brussels sprouts. Yeah, like a sweet, spicy cranberry sauce. Huh. So I'm pretty sure what made these meatballs so good was those cracklings. It's like having like really good pork fat in them. So these are good. <laughs> yeah. Well. They're delicious. And I know we're stoked about the two toppings or the two condiments that we made because mm -hmm. we don't really, I just feel like we like toppings in winter. We like to have little things to add to flavor our food even more, so. I couldn't agree more. We're gonna enjoy these this winter. Absolutely. We're gonna enjoy dinner and we hope you enjoyed today's video.
I'm gonna meatball. Yeah, I'm thinking about which one I want. I think I'm gonna. You know what? I'm gonna do aerial style. Mix it all together. I'll do my best and sprout. If you really want to do the way I do sandwiches, <laughs> you have to get. You have to cut. I really put like. A, put a leaf of lettuce in there. Thank you. I really like. I love. I love both. I love both. They're just different. I really like this one a lot. I mean it. But that. I really like that that reminds me of cranberries because we don't eat cranberries. No. And it tastes like a cranberry. It's crazy that they're both so good on meatballs. Oh, meatball sandwich. Keto style.